Welcome to the Christ Life videocast from Christ Life Presbyterian Church in Toowoomba, Queensland, Australia. For more information, go to www.christlife.org.au. Let me ask you a question. What do you think it means to be Australian? What is it that, that makes us different as an Australian people? What are the values, the ways of living, the things that set us apart? Have you ever thought about this? Surely it has to be more than simply where we live or where we make our home. There must be something that sets us apart as a people and a nation. There's something distinct that makes us Australian. Maybe it's our our sense of humour, our inventiveness. Maybe it's our laid-back culture or the way that each of us live our lives. There are certain things that distinctively make us Australian. This isn't only the case for countries. You see, every culture and group has a distinctive way to live, distinctive values and priorities. Think about your family, for example. You have a distinct way of relating and functioning within your family. You have certain values that you prioritize. You do certain things together as a family. You're involved in certain things. There's a way that you operate as a family that sets you apart. Or think about your work culture. As a workplace, you do things in a certain way. You have certain values or lack of values. You prize certain things. There are certain processes and ways of doing things. You see, every culture and group has distinguishing values and ways of living that separate them from other cultures. And it's no different for God's people. It's no different for us as a church. Just as there are characteristics that distinguish Australians and families and workplaces, there are distinct ways of living that distinguish God's people. There are values and priorities that are different for God's people than for others. Paul has just spent 11 chapters in Romans describing how we are saved by faith and not by works. And now he is explaining what it means to live as one of God's people, those who are saved by faith. He's talking about what distinguishes us. These things that he talks about aren't ways of salvation or ways to be right with God. They are the outworking of the salvation that we have received by faith in Jesus. That's what Paul was talking about in Romans 12 too, where he says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. You see, as God's people, we don't live like the world does. We don't live in the same way that they do. We don't have the same values that they do. There are things that set us apart as God's people. Here in this passage, Paul gives us three things, three examples of how God's people are different, how they are set apart, how God's people live. Notice what he says. He says that God's people live by law. He says that God's people live by love. And he says that God's people live by light. We're going to to see these in a moment. But as we go through, we must always keep in mind that these aren't three steps to be right with God. This is the outflowing of the saving faith that we have in Christ. This is what it looks like to live as one of God's people. So let's dive in. Let's see what Paul has to say. He begins by saying that God's people live by law. By this, he's talking about obeying and submitting to the authorities. Notice what he says in verse 1. If you've got a Bible there, have a look at Romans 13, verse 1. He says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. You see, as God's people, we are to live in obedience and submission to the government to those who have been placed in authority over us. We are to live according to their their laws and, and the things that they set down. We are to willingly submit ourselves to them, to recognize our place. Paul gives us three reasons why we should do this. 
Three reasons why we should submit to God, to the authority of the governing uh, authorities. He begins by saying, because of God's sovereignty. Because of God's sovereignty. He says this in the second half of verse 1. He says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. We've already seen in Romans that God is sovereign over all things. Nothing in the universe happens that is outside of his control and outside of his power. Every government that rises or falls does so by God's sovereignty. Every king or queen who rules, every prime minister, every government is in place because of God's sovereignty and authority. Just to show how important this point is, Paul repeats it. He says the authorities that exist have been established by God. Paul explains the implications of this for our lives in the next verse. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. You see, to rebel against the authorities that God has put in place is to rebel against something that God has instituted. It is to rebel against God himself. An act of rebellion that will surely be judged and surely be punished. See, to rebel against the authorities is not just to rebel against the Australian government or to rebel against the Prime Minister. It is to rebel against God himself. Uh, Think of it like this. Uh, Recently, my wife and I were able to spend some time away in South Australia with some friends of ours. And these friends of ours have a little three-year-old girl, Crystal, and she's great fun. And one day, uh, Jess and uh, and the the wife that we were staying with needed to go out and get some things from the shops. And so they asked if I would look after Olivia and Crystal uh, while they were gone. Timidly, I agreed uh, to look after the three-year-old and the nearly two-year-old. And, uh, and play with texts and things. But before she left, the, the mother bent down to her three-year-old girl, and she says, now, Crystal, you need to listen to Mr. Rowe, okay? You need to obey him and to do what he says while mummy's gone. You need to listen to him. Now, you see, once they were gone, if Crystal had disobeyed me and done the wrong thing and rebelled against me, then she would not only have been disobeying me, she would have been disobeying her parents. She would have been disobeying the direct instruction of her mother to listen to me. In the same way, to rebel against the authority that God has instituted is to rebel against God because God has put them in place. And God has told us to submit to them. So we cannot rebel against God in this way. Paul gives us a second reason that we should submit to the authorities. Because of punishment. The second reason that Paul gives is because of being punished for the wrong thing. Notice what he says in verse 3. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the one in authority? Then free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and he will commend you. He continues in verse 4. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. You see, God has put the authorities in place. He has given them authority to punish those who break the law. They do this to maintain law and order in society, to keep things running the way they should be running. And whether they know it or not, they are doing that by God's authority to restrain sin in the culture. See, if we submit to the governing authorities as God commands, if we obey the rules and the regulations that they have set down, 
If we do the right thing and recognize their place and ours, then we need not fear punishment. We need not fear being sent to jail or fined. Instead, we may even receive a reward for, what is, for doing what is right, Paul says in verse 3. See, we are to submit the, to the authorities because of the punishment that we might receive if we do not. But Paul's not only giving practical reasons. Notice the third reason that he gives. Because of God's command. He says this in verse 5. He says, Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, not only for ourselves, but also because of conscience. You see, God has given us a command to submit to the governing authority. If we do not submit, then we are directly disobeying a command that God has given us. We are going against the conscience that God is renewing in our minds and in our lives. We are breaking God's command. You see, we should submit to the authorities because of God's sovereignty, because of punishment, and because of God's command. So what does this look like? Paul talks very practically in the next few verses. Uh, But really, it begins in verse 1, where he says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. You see, if we submit to the governing authorities, then we must obey the laws and decrees of the land. Not only the ones that we agree with, but all of them. Even when they seem to us unfair or deprive us of something that we think we deserve. Even when we think, oh, that's only a little law, it doesn't matter. We are to submit to the governing authorities and to obey the laws and decrees. That applies whether we agree with the current government or not, whether uh, it's a liberal government, a labor government, or even, dare I say it, a Greens government. Even in that case, we are to submit to the governing authorities over us. Just think about the day that Paul was writing in. It wasn't a a lovely Christian government when Paul was writing. Rome was in in control. They were ruling. It was a a nation that was totally pagan, worshipping the the emperor and, and other false gods. It was a culture that was totally violent. We're talking about the authorities who crucified Jesus. And it was a a culture that would eventually go on to persecute Christian people. That's the sort of government that Paul was writing about. And he says, submit to the governing authorities. Amazing, isn't it? And so we obey the law. Now, there is one exception to this. One thing that I should note. You see, God's authority is always our highest authority. Where the authorities go directly against God's commands, then we may disobey. In fact, we must disobey. If they command us to do something that God commands us not to, we cannot obey them. We must obey God. If they command command that we don't do something that God commands explicitly that we do, then we cannot obey them. We must obey God instead. You see, God is our highest authority. But these circumstances are are not ordinary. They are out of the ordinary. It it rarely will happen for us uh, under the government that we have. It's not just that we disagree. It's that they're blatantly going against God's commands. And so that's the one exception. Apart from that, we live by and obey the rules and regulations that they have set down. We also pay our taxes. Notice what Paul says, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. You see, to submit to the authorities is to pay the taxes that we rightfully owe to the governing authorities. As God's people, we don't cheat on our taxes. We don't take every sneaky trick in the book to avoid paying tax. I know some of them because I used to be a tax accountant. See, we don't hide money that we've received. We pay what we owe according to the law. That's what it looks like to submit to the governing authority. 
And finally, we give to everyone, especially the governing authorities, what we owe to them. Give everyone what you owe to him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. You see, taxes and revenue we've talked about, we give what we rightfully owe by law, but we also give respect and honour. Because of their position that they are in, appointed by God, those who govern over us are worthy of our respect and our honour for their work. We are to give them this respect and honor. Instead of mocking and ridiculing our leaders, Paul talks about respecting and honoring them. Instead of going behind our back to complain about everything that that our current government is doing, Paul talks about respecting and honoring them. That is how God's people submit to the governing authority. So we see that God's people are to live by the law, to submit to the authority. Paul adds another thing that distinguishes the way that God's people are to live. God's people are to live by love. He makes this really tidy transition to talk about this topic. Notice what he says. He says, let no debt remain outstanding. Paul makes this beautiful transition from one point to the next. He makes it using the link of paying what we owe. In doing so, he moves from obeying the governing authorities to another way that God's people live. His main point isn't not to have any debts. His point is to not let them remain outstanding, to to pay them according to what we've agreed and what we've contracted to do. And, and And he makes this point, makes this transition to talk about a continuing debt that we owe to one another. Notice what he says. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. See, ever since chapter 12, when Paul started unpacking what it looks like to live as God's people, he's been talking about loving one another. This isn't optional. It's a debt that we all owe. And it's a debt that is continuing. We never totally repay our debt to love one another. No matter how much we've loved others, we can never stop loving them. Whether you're 19 or 90, all of us must continue to love one another. Notice what he says next about loving one another. By doing so, we are fulfilling God's law. He says, accept the continuing debt to love one another, for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. By loving others, we are living in such a way that fulfills God's law, God's commands that he has given us throughout the Bible. Throughout the Old and the New Testaments, God gives us his commands and decrees for how his people should live. He's not mean and cruel, setting down rules to try and limit us and to to limit the amount of fun that we can have. He's giving us the best way for people to live and flourish. This is the creator's guide to what good life looks like. This includes the Ten Commandments and all the other laws that God has given to his people. But all of us have broken these laws. All of us have disobeyed God's commands. And all of us deserve God's punishment for what we've done. But Paul is absolutely clear in Romans that we can never make ourselves right with God by doing the things that he says, by trying to to impress him with good deeds and hope they outbalance our bad deeds. We can never make ourselves right with God by simply trying to do the right thing. It's impossible. The only way that we can be right with God is through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. By faith in him and what he has done for us, we can be made right with God not by seeking to fulfill the law on our own. It's only by faith that we become God's people. And so if, if you're here and you, you're thinking, I've never put that faith in God, I've never thought about a different way to be made right with God than simply trying to do good things, then today's the day to think about that. Today's the day to choose to put your faith in Jesus Christ. 
And if you'd like to do that, I or one of the elders here would love to have a chat to you. That's exciting. But you see, now that we have faith in God, now that we are made right with God through the work of Jesus Christ, we are to live according to God's law. We are to live according to the way that God has set down that life should look. When we love others, we are fulfilling this law. That's what Paul is saying. Notice what he says in the next verse. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, Jesus said that in Matthew 7, 12. He was agreeing with Paul, or, or Paul was agreeing with Jesus, that, that in this command to love one another, we are fulfilling the whole law, summing it up. Paul talks about it here. If we are obeying this command to love each other, then we are fulfilling what God has commanded. And firstly, in the things that God has commanded us not to do, where God says, don't do this. Paul says this in verse 9. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, if we are loving our neighbor, then we won't commit adultery with our neighbor's wife. If we are loving our neighbor, then we won't murder them. We won't steal from them things that don't belong to us. We won't cover the things that other people have because we love them and we desire that they would have good things. You see, even all the other commandments are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. If we are truly loving our neighbor, then we won't do any of these things to them. And we will accordingly fulfill God's law. Paul kind of sums it up in the next verse. He says, love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. By loving each other, we won't harm each other, but we will fulfill God's commands. But this is really only half of the story. It's only a part of what we're talking about. You see, don't is one side of it, but but there are things that we are to do as well. Loving each, loving each other is more than just not doing X or Y. Think about it for a second. Uh, imagine if you're a parent and all you did for your kids is not mistreat them, not starve them, not psychologically damage them. You're making this effort not to hurt them, but that's all you do. You don't do anything else. Would that be loving your children? Well, yes, it's loving not to hurt them but it's not the full picture. There's something missing. There's so much more. Love is not only not doing bad things, it's also doing good things for those who we love. It's caring for our children and loving them when they're sick. It's providing for their needs by providing food, safety, and education. It's sacrificing our own wants and needs to give to them. That's what it looks like to really love our kids more than just not doing things to them. And so when Paul says, love your neighbor as, our, as yourself, he's talking about a self-sacrificial love, a love that gives of ourselves to others. Paul says that we are to love each other as we love ourselves. I'm sure that you'll go out of your way to help and to serve yourself in the same way Paul is commanding us to go out of our way to love and to serve and to help each other. Paul talked about this earlier in chapter 12 when he said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. See, this kind of love goes out of its way to serve and to care for others to show hospitality, to confront sin where required, to bless and to pray for even our enemies when they persecute us. But this kind of love extends far beyond simply the church walls. We are to love our neighbor, and that includes everyone we come in contact with. It includes our neighbors, those who live next door to us. 
It includes the other parents at our school. It includes our friends. It includes our work colleagues. The person in front of us and behind us in the checkout line. The, the checkout person includes every single person we come into contact with. We, as God's people, are called to love and to serve these people self-sacrificially. To love our neighbour. What a challenge. What a huge command that God is giving us. A way that God's people are to live. That God's people are to be known by this kind of love for others. And by loving in this way, we are fulfilling God's law and God's commands. But Paul doesn't finish there. He has one more thing to add to how God's people live. And that is that God's people live by light. Notice what he says in verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. You see, we are to do this understanding the present time. God's people are to live in these ways by, by submitting to the governing authorities, by living according, according to love. All these things that Paul has talked about, we are to do them understanding the present time. What is this present time that Paul is talking about? Paul's reminding us that Jesus is coming back. He, he makes this really clear. He says, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Paul's not talking about our salvation as in being made right with God. That has happened when we have faith in Christ. Remember, he's talking to people who are already saved, who already have faith. Instead, he's talking about the day when Jesus will return, when Jesus will judge the living and the dead, when he will deal with sin and sickness and death and suffering forever, when he will give us new bodies that are free of those things and free of the curse. He's talking about the day when God's work in creation and God's work in us will finally be brought to completion. That day of salvation that is coming ahead. See, Paul's point is that we are in the last days. We are in those days before Christ will return. And we don't know when Jesus will return. In fact, the only thing we do know is that we don't know when Jesus will return. That's a really clear thing. But we know that we are living in these last days. We are, we are living in a time where Paul says the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Have you ever been up early enough to see the sunrise? Have you ever, you ever been around and, and uh, you know, the world is dark and then as the sun approaches the horizon, things start to get lighter and lighter. You, you start to get that dawn, dusky kind of glow in the world. Things start to happen. And although the sun isn't up yet, you can, you can start to see until that moment when the sun in all its beauty bursts over the horizon. We are living in that time, that time before the sun will rise and the sky is getting lighter and lighter. At any moment, the sun, Jesus Christ, could burst onto the scene and bring light and that day of salvation. See, we are living in that time when the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. That's the time that we're living in. And so Paul says that we are to live accordingly. Accordingly to the fact that Jesus is coming back. To, to live in a way that is fitting for those who are God's people in these last days. Notice what he says in verse 12. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Our living in the light, living according to these last days must consist of two things, that we put aside the deeds of darkness and that we put on the armor of light. 
Paul gives us some examples of what this looks like in the next couple of verses. Firstly, that we as God's people don't live by darkness. He says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. See, for God's people, living in the time that we do, we must be totally serious about dealing with sin in our lives. This is not an optional part of being one of God's people. It's not, we can tolerate this little sin over there. That's okay, I don't have to deal with that. See, we must be absolutely 100% sold out about fighting sin in our lives. Paul gives us some examples. He says, not in orgies and drunkenness. You see, the word orgies here means wild, drunken parties and feasting. As God's people, we don't get drunk and get involved in wild, over-the-top, sinful parties. We don't go out to the clubs every night to get drunk and party out of control. We live in the light, not in this way of darkness. He says, not in sexual immorality and debauchery. You see, as God's people, we don't involve ourselves with sexual immorality. We don't indulge in satisfying our sexual desires the way that the world does. We don't satisfy ourselves by sitting in front of a computer screen or or through trashy novels or by fantasizing about being with people who aren't our spouse. We live according to God's ways for sexuality. Finally, we don't live in dissension and jealousy. As God's people, we don't fight amongst each other and cause disputes and disagreements so that we might get what is best. We don't respond to each other with jealousy and envy. We don't size each other up by our possessions, our jobs, our families. We don't pick fights over ridiculous things. We love each other self-sacrificially. In all of these areas and more, we have to be radically committed to fighting sin in our lives. Paul talks about the flip side in the next verse. We are not to live in darkness, but we are to live by light. Instead of living in darkness and in sinful, rebellious deeds, Paul commands us to live in such a way as to remember and reflect Christ's return. He says, rather... Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this means that that we are living out of what he has done for us. We are always remembering what Christ has done through his death and resurrection. That he has freed us from the penalty and power of sin in our lives. And he is working to change us. And so we participate with him in that work. We strive to grow more like him. We grow in relationship with him through prayer and the reading of his word. And this flows out in striving to live more like him. That we are growing to be more patient, more kind, more loving, more gentle, more self-controlled. We are growing more and more the way that God desires us to be. More and more like Christ. And Paul exhorts us to participate with God in that work, to to strive to grow in Christ's likeness, to put on these things of Christ. And he finishes with this incredible statement, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You see, as God's people, we are so serious about sin that we don't even think about how to satisfy our sinful desires. As God's people, we don't spend time dreaming up new ways to sin, new ways to satisfy our desires like sinful mankind does. Think back to Romans chapter 1 where Paul says that they are thinking of new ways to sin all the time. We don't do that. Instead, we don't even think about how to gratify our sinful desires. Instead, we clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ, deliberately turning our mind to good and godly things. Paul talks about this in, in his letter to the Philippians as well, where he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, lovely, whatever is admirable, 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, as God's people, we turn our minds away from sin, away from how to satisfy the desires of our sinful flesh, and we turn our minds towards godly and admirable things, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable, things that are excellent and praiseworthy. We deliberately turn our thoughts towards these things instead of towards sinful things. Now, it's worth pausing there to remember God's gracious promise to us. See, I'm sure if you're like me, that that you hear this passage and you can recognize times in your life when you have thought about sinful things, when you have lived in a way that is not fitting for God's people. Let me encourage you with this that through Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven of those things and equipped and enabled to live as God's people in the future. God says, uh, John says in, in his letter to, uh, in John chapter 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins and he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, there is comfort for us there, recognizing that we have sinned against God confessing it to him and receiving his forgiveness. And so we live now on into the future, not thinking about sinful things, but turning our mind towards godly things. You see, every culture has distinguishing ways of living and doing things. And as God's people, as those who have been saved by grace, we are to live distinctively from those around us. We are to live in a way that is different, a way that sets us apart, a way that doesn't conform with the patterns of this world. Here in this passage, Paul has given us three examples, three ways that this looks. That we, as God's people, are to live by law, that we are to live by love, and that we are to live by law. As God's people, we must live in a way that is fitting of a great God, in a way that is fitting of all that he has done for us, in a way that looks forward to the day when he will come back soon. And so let us live as God's people every day. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you that you are indeed worthy of all worship and praise and glory. And we thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Lord, we confess that there are so many times when we have not lived as your people, when we have disobeyed the governing authorities, when we have not loved one another as we ought, when we have not lived in such a way that looks forward to your coming soon. And Lord, we confess those things to you and we thank you for your promise to forgive us. Lord, we ask that you would be at work in our hearts and in our lives, that you would be helping us to live as your people. And Lord, that as we go out this week, that we might live submitting to those who govern over us, that we might live loving each other self-sacrificially and radically, and, Lord, that we might live serious about sin, living in your ways, ready for your return. (coughs) We pray this in Jesus' name, our Saviour and our hope. Amen.